resume. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, so simple bitters. We covered everything that they do. And let's give some examples. So we've got artichoke leaf. Gentian is a really common drink bitter. So we see gentian um, a lot in like Angostura bitters and any kind of typical drink bitters used in cocktails. We've got wild lettuce is a bitter, really lots of forms of lettuce. So this is why green salads are traditionally eaten before meals because they used to be more bitter and they stimulate digestion. They also lower your blood sugar a lot. Um, and they, sorry, they lower the amount of spike that you will get from like a carbohydrate rich meal if you eat bitters and or a bitter salad before your meal. Cascara Sagrada is a really common one that people uh, use a lot. It, it is um, a stimulant laxative. You can find it in like smooth move tea. Um, and then hops are bitter. So is anybody kind of familiar with this taste? A little bit. Would, would motherwort be possible? Motherwort is incredibly bitter, yeah. Is that, is that a simple bitter? Yes. It has an aromatic twinge, but it's it's kind of, yeah, it's a simple bitter. Also, it's kind of hard for me to like log it, you know? Wow. If I haven't, if I'm not like actively tasting it, categorizing it can sometimes be hard. Mm -hmm. But yes, it is definitely a bitter. And honestly, motherwort has an acridity to it. It's, it, I don't know if it's straight up an alkaloidal bitter, but it definitely has um, that acrid flavor oh, really? that we'll talk about. Oh. Awesome. Okay. All right. So some properties of simple bitter herbs shunts blood flow to the digestive organs, supports liver detoxification processes, stimulates stomach acid production, supports healthy bile and enzyme production, supports healthy appetite and reduces sugar cravings. And some are stimulant laxatives. Now these also like when we talk about hops, it's incredibly useful as a phytoestrogen. Um, when we talk about wild lettuce, it's great for pain. So like you can use simple bitters. They can be used for other things and have other properties. Just trying to kind of reiterate, this is an umbrella concept. All bitters are going to do most of these things. That doesn't mean that's all they do. Okay. Fragrant bitters. So this is the next one. So fragrant bitters are aromatic. When you taste them, you have simultaneously a bitter taste and a weird in your nose, aromatic, fragrant taste that often resembles perfume. So if you think about like Ella campaign and I'm just, I've decided that I did this in the wrong order and I'm going to skip forward and give you examples of the taste first and then go back just so you know, that's what I'm going to do from now on. So Ella Campaign is a fragrant bitter, black walnut hulls, wormwood, tansy, worm seed, feverfew, bitter orange, and sweet annie. When I chose these herbs, I tried to pick the most like typified and also most broadly utilized of these herbal medicines so that you could like maybe log the taste and or um, have some experience with it. But all of these are going to be simultaneously incredibly bitter and floral in some capacity. So is anybody familiar with this taste and can kind of pull it up in memory? Ella campaign is definitely one that comes up um, and I think is a really good example and a good one. Like if you want to, after this class, go to your local herb shop and pick out one of each of these plants so you can kind of taste, I would say Ella campaign is a really good one. Okay, 
So let's go back. So there's a combination of aromatic constituents. So when we see aromatic constituents, they're going to be essential oils. They tend to hit you in the nose. Um, and when you're tasting things, try to notice that. So like, say when you're smelling an essential oil, you'll feel like a burny, tingly sensation in your mouth or in your nose. And when you taste bitter, fragrant herbs, you taste the bitter on your tongue, but then you get a smell because it hits your tongue and then evaporates out of your nose. Um, and uh, so I always think that's kind of interesting. So a lot of times these are floral and they have citrus notes. Oh, yes. Fragrant bitters versus simple bitters, as far as the comparison, fragrant bitters tend to be more warming and drying than simple bitters. Simple bitters tend to be more cooling. So if somebody has sluggish digestion um, where I want to warm the digestive tract, then um, say, I don't have a great example in mind, but like in pregnancy, when people are nauseous, there's a lot of heat and fire and like metabolic um, activity where they're overstimulated. Their, their whole body is very much in a high metabolic state and you don't necessarily want to warm them while you stimulate digestion and help with their nausea. You would choose a simple better preferentially, which people, pregnant people love ginger and like, it's kind of a standard thing to give people ginger, but sometimes that doesn't feel good for people. Um, so just like, just mental note, uh, it's good to stimulate digestive sluggish digestive system, promote excretion and support healthy bacterial balance in the gut. Definitely when I'm seeing sluggish, lower GI, like constipation, I'm going to be doing, um, uh, fragrant bitters and choosing fragrant bitters kind of preferentially. I also often use fragrant bitters, um, when people have lung infections because essential oils will tend, will get excreted via the lungs, um, and can really help with that kind of con congestion. Like Ella campaign is used specifically for lung infections. Um, so general properties of fragrant bitters, digestive stimulants, antiparasitic, they do tend to be antiparasitic, um, especially black walnut and sweet annie and wormwood are all traditionally um, antiparasitic. Expectorant and then mildly laxative is this helpful? You guys like in this part? <laughs> Just doing a check-in. <laughs> Did someone have a question? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to like compare everything to things that I've been studying recently. So would pine be a fragrant bitter? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good, good job. Yes. And um resins are typically like just in that fragrant camp. They tend to be anti-infective, antibacterial, antifungal. Um, they're just in, and you, some of them, let's see, quite often resins are, are bitter aromatics. They're not just aromatic. You don't see like, even like things like calendula is incredibly resinous and very bitter. Um, so I do think there might be, I, I'm like running through all of the resin rich plants. And I do think most of them are fragrant bitters and not just aromatic. Um, but yeah, good, good question. Good connection. Nicely done. Uh, alkaloidal bitter herbal medicines. Alkaloidal bitters taste bitter they tend to have an acrid or bile-like taste. So like literally they feel like you just threw up and, or you almost threw up and it's just like in the back of your throat and you're like, 
it's gross. This clues us into our their properties. They are digestive simulants. Um, they're not, yeah, we have a whole category that are just alkaloidal that don't necessarily work on the digestive system, but alkaloidal bitters really specifically have the paired action of bitters and they have alkaloidal properties. When things are alkaloidal, we see uh, anything that's alkaloidal, the primary chemical constituents will have INE at the end. So caffeine, lobaline, nicotine, uh, morphine, they all are uh, alkaloidal. And they all have really, generally speaking, incredibly strong action on the nervous system. Um, they either tend to stimulate the nervous system or relax the nervous system. And they tend to be quite like knock you over the head. Um, like caffeine, no one's going to argue that that is stimulating, um, except for people with ADHD, but <laughs> there's always a caveat somewhere. Um, so alkaloidal taste, that acrid flavor lets us know that there are alkaloids in that, in that plant. So a really good example of an alkaloidal bitter is going to be a berberine containing plants. These are golden seal, Oregon grape, barberry, chocolate, and coffee are al also alkaloidal bitters. And then we've got California poppy. Alkaloidal bitter plants tend to be cooling and drying energetically. So it's just like I say, you get an acrid taste and bitter. They're really strong and really terrible. They're doubly terrible. <laughs> Properties of alkaloid or bitter plants, same as other bitters. So support digestive function, stimulate digestion. They support healthy bile and stomach acid production. They often have stimulating or sedating effects. And those tend to be on the nervous system and the glands. So coffee and chocolate are great examples. They're stimulating to the digestive system and stimulating to the nervous system. Now we switch from bitters. So those are three types of bitters. We switch over to kind of a whole nother category and these will all be signed up sort of individual and not overlapping. We have astringent herbal medicines. Anybody familiar with that? Like dry wine, unripe persimmon flavor. Yeah, so it's pretty distinct. So green tea is a, um, an astringent plant. Unripe persimmons, like I said, white oak bark is really drying and astringent. Uva ursi, sage is, if you do sage tea. Um, oof. And then we've got, um, yeah, green tea. And wild geranium is incredibly tannic and, uh, and astringent. So a lot of times when I'm teaching, I'll use the word or phrase tannic um, interchangeably with astringency because tannins are astringent and astringent plants tend to have tannins. Um, they taste bitter and they have a puckering and drying effect on the mouth tissues and the body. So... I tell the story all the time and I never gets old. I had a client come in, she had incontinence and she, uh, I did her intake. We were, she'd been going to a physician that she wasn't getting much traction. And I did her intake in the first, I spent about two hours doing intake. And in the first 15 minutes, I asked her, what are you doing uh, for, you know, like your drink every day? Like, what are you drinking? And um, she you know, let me know that she was drinking basically exclusively black and green tea. And tannins are used in tanning of hides. And that means they like pull proteins out, dry out the tissue. And, um, and so she was tanning her own bladder with black and green tea because she was drinking so much of it. And 
I, I really appreciate just this whole, the whole scenario, because, you know, I think it's important that we remember that any herb can, can be contraindicated. Like we can do damage by doing too much of a good thing. And sometimes it, it also, it's important to recognize that, um, every plant is not good for every person. Um, people love to be like, red raspberry leaf for all pregnant people. And I'm just like, if I had drinking red raspberry tea the whole time I was pregnant, I would just have dried up and floated away and turned into a piece of paper. It is not, it, I can't, I can't do drying things. Like just like this woman should not have been doing drying tannic herbs all the time. And um, so anyway, astringent plants, you need to use in moderation and for specific issues or concerns in higher dosage for short periods of time, and then just be aware. And then I always, for me, if I want some green tea, I just offset it with something goopy. So marshmallow, or I pretty much add marshmallow to all black tea um, because I'm a dry person. And I have to do it with coffee too. Um, but yes, so tannins, are going to pucker and dry tissue. And they're really useful for drying and constricting. And we want to use them in instances and situations where tissues are blown out. So like think hemorrhoids, which I know is a graphic, <laughs> graphic pairing of words. But, <laughs> but um, if we've got hemorrhoids, if we've got a bleeding ulcer, if we've got like runny sinuses that just will not quit. Like if somebody is just leaking fluid out of their sinuses constantly, we want to dry that up because they're losing all of the water in their whole body through their nose and they just can't keep up. And they end up with chronic dryness in the rest of their tissues because their sinuses are leaking water. So we want to do a neti pot with tannic herbs and dry up that tissue so that it no longer is losing life force rapidly. Um, so astringent plants are super effective and lovely for, for all of those indications. Um, we want to use them to arrest excessive secretions. So blood mucus stool, like if somebody has diarrhea, astringent plants are really great. Reduce swelling, tighten loose tissues. And this is important. And it always sounds like kooky when I say it, but they're anti-venomous. So when, if you call poison control, a lot of times they'll tell you to do black or green tea or charcoal or milk. And those are our, like the three primary options, black and green tea tannins will bind alkaloids and make them inactive. They have a really high affinity for alkaloidal plants and alkaloids are incredibly active on the nervous system and the central nervous system. So we want to when we're working with venoms, a lot of times they're alkaloidal. So you can put tannic herbs on a sting or a bite um, and it will, de it will bind so, um, and deactivate basically the, the venoms. Um, uh, you can also use, you know, there's charcoal and milk for other types of chemicals and constituents. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's another thing that you can use astringent plants for. And then we will use it to tone intestinal membranes. So if you've got leak, if we've seen leaky gut, lots of food allergies, um, uh, C. diff, like I'll use it in kind of really intense gut um, issues, IBS with D, um, that's IBS, irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea, sorry. Um, and yeah, so that's astringent herbs sour herbal medicines. So sour, sour plants contain citric acid, malic acid, or ascorbic acid, and or flavonoids. And a lot of times all of those. <laughs> um, we've got things like everybody recognized sour. So apple cider vinegar is a good example of sour, something sour, ferments are sour, berries, schizandra is a sour plant. Um, lemon, rose hips, hawthorn, and noni. 
they astringe tissue in a different way. They, um, they tighten and tone tissue by strengthening them when they have ox chronic oxidative damage. So like blown out capillaries in the face from people drinking too much alcohol or, um, you know, anytime that we see chronic oxidative damage from things like diabetes, I do high dose blueberries because I want them, those tissues to get antioxidants and get tightened and toned in that way. Um, so incredibly important for detoxification, incredibly important to provide antioxidants and to repair damage in tissues, um, specifically when they're damaged from things like diabetes or smoking or things like that. Or like, I would say um, in situations where like, like I had some vein issues when I was pregnant because of the estrogen um, and, and just high amounts of hormones in general in my body. And I was not able to do tannic plants, but I, but I needed cardiovascular tonics and I needed something that would tighten and tone my venous tissue. And so I really focused on doing high dose, um, uh, sour plants. So they're antioxidant. They reduce inflammation and irritation through being antioxidant. They reduce free radical damage, same drill lower fevers, they can be really effective, um, for fevers. And, and actually I have a formula called that I used to sell. And when I had a product line called Alabama heat, and it was really specifically made for people who are like roofers and landscapers in the middle of Alabama's like hot summers. And, um, I put a lot of sour plants and, um, in that combination, in that formulation, to really help people cool people down. Uh, and you know, we're not, nobody's going to argue with me that like, what do you crave in the summertime? Lemonade. Everyone wants lemonade because it's sour and it's cooling. Uh, because the heart and the eyes and the liver all run through antioxidants more rapidly than other types of tissue, they really specifically help those tissues. So cardiovascular system, eyes, gums, um, and, uh, yeah. Questions about sour plants. I'm not slowing about, down well uh, enough for questions. Sorry. <laughs> Y'all just stop me. Is sassafras mm. a sour? Right. Not, it depends. It is, um, it's cooling the, the body, but I guess it's not classified. The root is very warming. It's not super bitter. I think of it as a primarily a circulate a circulatory tonic and a blood builder. And then the leaves are very mucilaginous and they are cooling through being goopy. I don't really think of them as very sour. But that doesn't mean that some people might not taste sassafras and it be like sour to them but to me it's not very sour do you find it sour slightly mm -hmm. but um I, was, I guess i was more relating it to the cooling down of the body mm -hmm. in a really hot summer that's uh that's, that's what you like cold sassafras yeah because like a really hot day just if if you take sassafras it feels like a 70 70 degree day <laughs> do you do the root or do you do the leaves the root. Mm -hmm. okay the leaf yeah okay do you recommend the leaf over the root oh oh yeah yeah i would okay. yes i was that was a leading question <laughs> cool. um awesome okay all right and here we are at the other cooling plant mucilaginous herbs my tea is full of mucilaginous herbs. So mucilaginous herbs, they have high amounts of either polysaccharides, gum, mucilage, which is kind of a made up herbal term, um, and pectin. They're often very bland, very mildly sweet, and they have a thick mouthfeel that's coating and cooling. 
So think about chia seed, okra, sassafras leaves. Just as an aside tidbit, anytime that you really want to extract mucilage and polysaccharide, mucopolysaccharides from plants that are goopy, you will want to do a cold infusion. So you pour cool water over them, agitate them a whole bunch, crunch them up into teeny little pieces, even put them in a blender and then let it sit for a couple hours and do agitation to help it extract better. And you will end up with the best, goopiest, most refreshing beverage that <laughs> resembles snot. <laughs> Is that with fresh or dry or does it not matter too much? It doesn't matter. Okay. Does not matter. So aloe, slippery elm, kelp, okra, chia seeds, marshmallow. I just live on this stuff for my body. Really severe cases of... Um, like kind of debility where people are just run down and very weak and older, maybe dehydrated. I'll do slippery elm gruel. It is an endangered plant. It's a tree and it was over harvested. So I use it very sparingly. I tend to use marshmallow or licorice uh, in people. And also chia seeds are like widely available and grow really easy. Um, so things like chia seed pudding, as long as they're very well hydrated chia seeds. You don't want to give a dehydrated person straight chia seeds and then it absorb all of the water in their body. <laughs> it's incredibly uncomfortable. Um, mucilaginous plants soothe hot, dry, irritated tissue. Add water-soluble fiber to the stool. They feed healthy gut bacteria. They are prebiotic. They absorb bile and cholesterol, which is a general thing that all fiber does. Um, and it removes toxins by acting like binding agents. And remove being like, when your liver excretes toxins in bile through your common bile duct, the fiber from the mucilaginous plants will bind those toxins and make sure that they get excreted rather than get reabsorbed into your body. Sweet herbal medicines. Plants that taste sweet often contain polysaccharides, saponins, or sugar alcohols. So a lot of times mucilaginous plants and sweet herbs will be similar and have similar taste and, and or are interchangeable, like licorice, for example. Sweet plants trend as moistening, nourishing, and often energetically neutral, and they can be slightly warming or cooling. And they have a lot of the same indications as mucilaginous plants. So these are things like licorice, stevia, ginseng, both Korean and American ginseng are sweet, elruthro, and bee pollen. Sorry, just checking on chats and stuff. So we've got, um, some properties of sweet medicines, they tend to build up weakened uh, conditions. Like, so if somebody's debilitated, um, they're weak from having a cold. We just think about this as like very deeply nourishing. They're almost food-like um, and they tend to replenish energy reserves. Uh, they support healthy stress response and sometimes act as stimulants. So that's like ginsengs are stimulants. They're very stimulant. Um, Right. They, they are stimulating plants um, and they do and can be um, in really small doses adaptogenic. 
I do not like using them in large doses because I tend to think that they act more like coffee than they do act like an adaptogen. I prefer um, as far as like building up tissue and helping people that are really weakened and kind of debilitated or burnt out. I much prefer doing ashwagandha and cross spine and things like skull cap over using stimulant type herbs that are nourishing like shizandra or elruthro or um, ginseng, any, either one of the ginsengs. Oily herbal medicines, pretty straightforward. Oily herbs have high amounts of fixed oils in them. Fixed oils are not essential oils. They're, they're thicker, they're heavier, and they're um, goopy. So mostly these are omega-6 fatty acids in plants. Um, rarely they're omega-3 fatty acids. Plants that contain high amounts of fat have a thick, neutral, and fatty taste. <laughs> Big surprise. They have a mouthfeel that is silky. They tend to make us feel full due to their caloric content. Oily plants tend to be nourishing and soothing and help tissues be more pliable. Oily medicines, so these are things like flax seed, chia seed, evening primrose seed, coconut, olives. So we've got, these are all, you know, gamma linoleic acid um, is a common one. So evening primrose has a lot of GLA. And so a lot of people will just take GLA instead. Um, but doing flax seed or chia seed, um, is just a great part of a well-rounded diet and making sure that you're processing and digesting that fat is also incredibly important. A lot of people have gallbladder issues or liver issues, and they're not absorbing and processing oily, oily, even just oil from their food. So some of the ways that you know, whether somebody is processing, uh, fats in their, in their diet well, or sorry, it's easier to tell if someone is not processing fats well, tend to have dry skin, um, not pliable, their skin is not pliable. Some big indications are their poop. So if their poop floats, if there's an oily sheen on the toilet when they take a poo and then you look and then there's like a sheen because there's fat that hasn't been broken down in their poop. If their poop is like an orangey colored, that's often indicative, indicative of a gallbladder problem or that they're not processing fats well. Or this is classic old terminology. If they have bilious colic, it's when you smell fat and get nauseous. So if you smell fatty foods, then you have a hard time processing and digesting it. And this is really common in people that become vegetarians and vegans. They smell, they start to smell like they smell meat and they get sick and nauseous. They smell fat and they get sick and nauseous. And then they're like, my body must not like fat. My body must not like protein. I just need to be a vegetarian or vegan. And then they, then they feel so much better because they weren't processing and digesting fats well. And so, um, a lot of times like that tends to be kind of a trend and, um, and if we work on their digestive health, they'll often start and work on their gallbladder. Well, they'll often start like craving fats um, and really want to increase those in their diet. Awesome. So moist and dry tissue, promote tissue flexibility, support home hormonal balance. GLA is really important um, in that and in, in female hormones. Um, uh, I also... Uh, really like fatty, um, is particularly omega threes for working with mental health and, um, helping decrease, um, neural inflammation and inflammation in general. Most of the time people with standard American diets get plenty of omega sixes and they're lacking in omega threes. And so I tend to really shut my focus on making sure that we're getting fish oil and plant-based omega threes, especially if, if they're vegetarian or vegan. Um, pungent herbal medicines. Pungent's a real specific flavor. It's spicy or hot. So I'm going to give you guys examples first. So ginger, 
mustard, cayenne, horseradish, black pepper, thyme, eucalyptus. They all give you that burny nose feeling. So pungent is like a burn in your nose. They're, all of those are high in essential oils. So pungent herbs are high in resins, alchemides, allyl sulfides, monoterpenes, and sesquiterpene essential oils. Which are just types and types of essential oil, families of essential oil. They tend to be intensely warming. So just think back to that list like mustard, ginger, intensely warming. They support thinning of mucus, which is why they're so great when you have a cold. You just take a shot of ginger and immediately you're like, oh, that's why fire cider is so effective because it just it makes all of your tissues just run because it's trying to rinse off the irritant and then it rinses off bacteria and in, in at the same time um increased secretions as well as acting as anti-infectives and anti-parasitics um this is why we see really high amounts of um pungent spices used in traditional cultures where the climate is hot because food spoils more readily and they have higher amounts of parasites in, in, in their just environment because it's so hot um, and moist. So they tend to move energy upwards and outwards. So if you'll think about taking ginger and then like your kind of, your blood flow goes up and out, you're hot. And it tends to focus a lot of heat into the head and the face and the sinuses. Induces perspiration, stimulates circulation, dispels stagnation, which is kind of like, that's not definitely not a modern way of describing. <laughs> um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to mute. Oh, okay. Um, dispelling stagnation is like when... We have sluggishness in tissues. We have sluggish lymph. We have sluggish, maybe we've got a lot of congestion and it's stuck. That's when we use pungent herbs. That's when we use fire cider. Um, and then, as I said before, anti-infective and anti-parasitic. Now we have aromatic plants. So Aromatic plants tend to have a high amount of volatile oils. Volatile oils are essential oils. They are volatile because they evaporate readily and rapidly off of the plant tissue and it, once they're extracted and or cut open. So like ginger, you have to cut vesicles open. And so like microplaned ginger is best when you're working with ginger. Things like rosemary have little vesicles that sit on top of the plant. So you can just brush the rosemary and it will be aromatic and you can smell all of that, um, which I just think is cool. Sorry, like sidebar tangent. Aromatic plants are warming, mildly drying, and tend to be uplifting to the nervous system, expectorant, and anti-infected. They're quite frequently antifungal also. Things like dill, peppermint, lemon balm, sage, basil, oregano, rosemary. The pot herbs, these are like European herbs that were brought to America by settlers. Those are, these are all like traditional European pot herbs is what they were called or strewing herbs. So people would use them in, um, in uh, their houses on the floor to make sure to keep rodents away, keep bugs away, keep sickness away because they were aromatic because you'd step on them and then essential oils would come into the air and then they would disinfect your sinuses and you would be less inclined to get ill. So aromatic plants impact the nervous system. They tend to be either calming or stimulating. They are not stimulating in the way that alkaloidal plants are. They're like uplifting, stimulating. Um, they won't like keep you awake. Does that make sense? So like coffee will like increase cortisol and make, and forcibly you will be awake. Um, these plants are like, you feel like basil essential oil, peppermint essential oil. You're just like, 
invigorated and ready to do the day, these are highly unlikely to make you like so hopped up that you can't go to sleep at night. Antimicrobial, they stimulate circulation. They are carminative, so they help you um, expel gas. So either get gas out through burping or tooting, or um, oftentimes you can actually excrete, uh, you actually excrete a lot of the gas created in your digestive system through your lungs, which is a fun fact. So it can upregulate how much gas you're breathing out, <laughs> which I don't know why it gets me every time I talk about it. Um, and then expectoration. So it helps us get mucus out. We're almost there, home stretch. Salty plants. So in salty herbal medicines, and I think that salty is kind of a misnomer. They taste more minerally to me than they do salty, but Salty slash minerally is how I describe this category. Salty herbal medicines are high in mineral salts, magnesium, potassium, sodium, calcium, and often silica. And I don't know what else I was going to say, but there's an and there. But I was adding in silica and other forms of minerals. Salty or mineral rich plants are balancing and nourishing. They provide minerals to support normal, healthy body processes and provide mineral needs. I highly recommend that the two things that people do across the board is do a mineral rich tea every day and digestive bitters with every meal. If everyone in the United States did that, we would have a way different health picture but doing salty herbal medicines to support our, we don't get enough minerals in our diets because our soils are deplete. It doesn't, you know, not everybody can grow all their food and we're just not getting enough minerals. So, uh, and we're not drinking mineral water. We're not drinking from like springs and wells and that sort of thing. So we're not getting enough minerals. And so doing mineral rich um, plants regularly is really important. And it, minerals extract best in cold water, once again. So any of these plants that I'm gonna list, alfalfa, seaweed, mullein, nettles, chickweed, red clover, and horsetail. It is very common for um, minerally plants to be very drying, which is a problem for people that are dry like me. So I always add in things like marshmallow, which is pretty mineral rich. Um, any of the mallows are going to be great. That will help to add some goopiness to the tea blends. If you guys are interested, you can email me and I'll send you my mineral rich tea recipe. That's kind of more geared towards being energetically or, um, uh, fluid neutral, <laughs> meaning like not too drying, not too moistening. Um, and uh, so, yeah, but nettles is really drying. Chickweed can even be drying. Um, seaweed, I find very neutral and not very dry. Sorry, it's getting late for me. Um, so yeah, so they moisten dry tissues and dry damp tissues. So that's a really important thing about salty and mineral rich plants is they actually help with fluid balance in our cells and tissues. So we have these osmotic gradients. We've got semi-permeable membranes in our cells and our cell walls and our connective tissue and our cells are constantly, you know, trading mineral salts and minerals and water. And so if you don't have appropriate amounts of minerals, then you're not going to be able to get correct osmosis between your cells and you're not going to be able to get appropriate fluid balance and your tissues will start to get dry. Um, and it's just not a good scene. So minerals, they help you stay hydrated. They, they help you feel really good. They help your cells communicate well. They help you clear your lymph um, and they support kidney function. It, minerals are incredibly important to our bodies and we do, really don't get enough. Awesome. Acrid herbs, I've kind of talked about these already. Acrid herbal medicines are high in resins and alkaloids they often taste acrid, which is the taste of bile in the back of your throat. It's burning 
it's bitter and it tastes like vomit. Just here to teach you things you'll never forget. Acrid herbs are often really strongly antispasmodic. They're particularly effective central nervous system relaxants or stimulants. So these are things like lobelia, kava. If you've ever gone to a kava bar, tobacco is incredibly um, uh, acrid. I don't know if anybody's ever tried one of those um, like pouchy things in your mouth. They're like, they're like the nicotine thingies, but they're very acrid because nicotine is, is acrid. That whole, all of the lobeline from lobelia it's really acrid. Kava is acrid. Tobacco is acrid. Coffee and chocolate. Again, we see cho coffee and chocolate. They're antispasmodic. So I love lobelia for relaxing the digestive tract. Um, they open up the flow of blood, lymph, and energy. They are circulatory relaxants often. So like lobelia and nicotine in particular, they relax smooth muscle. So you get better blood flow in capillary in your capillaries in your, in your venous tissue. Um, they also, um, uh, are circulatory stimulants because not only are they relaxing your smooth muscle so that they're relaxing your smooth muscle in your whole body. So that means like less spasm, less tension, but they're also because of that allow a lot more circulation to flood your body. Um, they help with migrating pain, which is kind of a really specific indication, or if people have alternating fevers and chills and constipation. Either one of those things, fever or chills or constipation diarrhea is what it should say. Sorry. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. You're welcome. This was really cool. And we can't wait to, I guess, get to know you more and learn more because this was very informative. Oh, awesome. Thanks. Thanks for saying that. Yeah. So I'm, I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about a couple of things that I have going on. My two programs that I run is a monthly herbal medicine subscription program. So I teach in depth about one plant per month. I have an online classroom. I read you the monograph so you can, I, I write, basically write a research paper talking about everything that I've learned about a plant clinically. I talk about my clinical experiences, stories that I have, my personal experience. And then I talk about any new research updates on the plant. I talk about how to find it, how to identify it, how to grow it. And then I ship you a kit so you can taste the plant while I'm teaching you which I think is really important <laughs> and super cool. Um, so I have that going on. And then I also have um, a foraging and medicine making intensive that I teach that's in person. It's one weekend per month for four months. And I actually have pictures from all of this. So here's the subscription. That's all the stuff I told you about. Really cool. So I do a monograph. I teach you how to forage it. Um, and then this is the medicine making course. So I teach, uh, there's like 250 pages of class material. Uh, we go on a plant walk every single month that we meet. Uh, I teach you how to blend teas. I teach you how to make tinctures. I teach you how to make salves. I teach you how to extract different constituents best. I teach you what questions, I basically teach you what questions you need to ask. Um, so that you can be the most effective in making herbs and, um, and extracting herbal medicines. We do plant walks. Another perk of the class is by the end, you just have like so much loot from class that it's just insane. This was one day of, um, we were covering oil-based preparations. We did a facial oil, a solid perfume. Lord knows what that is. A muscle rub and a nausea, which is a essential oil extract um, up your, that you use up your nose that's diluted in oil. I we teach it's over 40 hours of, of instruction. And then 
course material, 250 pages. So if you're interested in either one of those programs, I'm going to grab the links for you guys so that you can check out my website. I'm just going to type my website in because this feels like a lot right now. <laughs> Where'd y'all go? Um, where's the chat? <laughs> oh, well, it's deeprootsherbschool.com. And y'all can find, if you'll just go to the learn tab, then I have the medicine making course and I have the subscription program and you can sign up for either one there. And um, yeah. Thanks, Eve. So deeprootsherbschool.com. Everybody's so helpful. Does anybody have questions? No, yes. Awesome. You guys have been so great and lovely. And, um, I put my website in the chat box and I am only keeping the subscription program open for um, a little while longer. I have 60 spots open. I have currently 68 people in there. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know how much longer I'm going to keep it open, but join if you want. It's super cool. <laughs> Cool. Well, I enjoyed you guys and I, I hope you guys have a great night and, um, and I do these once a month. So please keep coming back and hanging out. And if you want me to teach about anything in particular, um, I would love ideas, thoughts, recommendations on what you're interested in and what you'd like to hear more about. Awesome. All right, y'all. Thanks so much. Thank you, Cameron. Bye. Have a good night.